Hi everyone, my name is Kirsten Elliott and I'm the Development and Communications Director here at Hawkwatch International and we're really pleased to have you join us today for the 2023 Global Raptor Research and Conservation Grant Announcement. Today I am joined by Dr. Megan Murgatroyd, our Associate Director of Asian and African Programs and Executive Director Nikki Wayman, who will be presenting the awards. Before we get started, I want to say a really special thank you to Caddis Enterprises. Caddis has been a longtime partner of Hawkwatch International, and this year they've decided to sponsor all of the grants. So we truly wouldn't be able to do this work without support from Caddis. So thank you so much. I also want to say a quick thank you to the Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks grant, which provides all of our programming for free in Salt Lake County, where many of you may be joining us from. Finally, I want to thank all of our supporters who provide so much support for this work that we do across the globe. Thank you. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Megan Murgatroyd to kick us off here in just a moment. Um, we will be taking a few questions at the end if you have any, so please feel free to use the chat function. Thanks again for joining us. So hi and welcome to Hawkwatch International's announcement of the winners of the Global Raptor Research and Conservation Grant. Um, I'm going to talk today about the background of our grant scheme, how it came about, the international program. Um, we'll share some news from last year's awardees and then we'll introduce uh, this year's winners and their projects. So in 2019, Hawkwatch launched the then the new international program. The overarching goals of the international program are to address raptor conservation priorities and knowledge gaps around the world while supporting local capacity development. And initially, this program was led by Dr. Evan Beakley. And now for the past year, I've been running the program from my base and home in South Africa. One of the initial goals of the international program was to do a global analysis of all raptor species to identify which raptor species and regions were in most need of investment. And this was published as a scientific paper in 2019. And some of the key uh, findings of this research were that about a quarter of raptor species have essentially never been researched. And in contrast to this, there's a small number of species which have had a huge amount of research done on them. But globally, um, species with a higher risk of extinction tend to actually be less studied. And we've seen the trend that tropical regions where there's the highest diversity of raptors and more raptors are threatened with extinction, uh, but less there's less research. So these are some of the major disparities that we wanted to try and level out a little bit. Um, the paper mapped conservation, uh, raptor conservation priority areas, which are shown here, and the warmer colors indicate higher priority areas for raptor conservation. So here you can see that high priority raptor conservation um, areas are mainly in the tropical regions of Central and South America, um, Africa, and Asia. So importantly, these uh, raptor conservation priority areas fall disprop disproportionately in countries which also have fewer economic resources. And generally, the cost of doing conservation work falls locally, for example, to local NGOs, universities or national governments. But yet the whole world benefits from actually conserving biodiversity. So to overcome this imbalance, we really need to start doing a better job at reallocating capacity and funding to places that need it most. And doing this can help forward conservation while promoting equity and diversity and inclusion in the conservation community, which are all important issues to tackle. And this is the basis of why Hawkwatch came up with the idea of doing this global grant. So the Global Raptor Research and Conservation Grant basically builds off those research find findings and aims to make a contribution to this um, kind of philosophy of global co conservation prioritization. And the basic guidelines of this grant for applicants uh, is to um, target projects on high priority raptor species in um, high priority regions um and for projects to be locally led so enabling capacity building 
And this is the third year now that we are awarding the grant and we accepted proposals up until the end of December last year for this round and we've spent the last month reviewing the applications. Um, this year's grants are funded by a really generous donation from Caddis Enterprises. They are a global leader in raptor conservation. Um, they develop perch guards and other products to prevent contact between raptors and power lines and so that their work can vastly uh, reduce the risk of raptor collisions. So first, I'm going to give a brief update on what last year's awardees have achieved so far and each of the projects that we fund is designed to be 18 months long. So these projects still have another six months until they're complete. So it can be treated as a bit of a, an update. Um, so first up, we had Asman Peranto, who's from Java, Indonesia, where he has co-founded Biza Indo Indonesia, which is an NGO that aims to preserve biodiversity and the welfare of local communities via research-based uh, conservation, education, and creation of sustainable li livelihoods. Asman applied for funding for a field survey of the Javan Scops Owl in Mount Meribu National Park in central Java. Now the Javan Scops Owl is endemic, it's a forest species and it's classified as vulnerable. It's, it's mostly threatened by habitat loss. There's very little um, information on the distribution of the species in central Java and there's been no previous scientific publications on it. Um, Asman and his team have been carrying out acoustic surveys along transects in the forest to identify if the owls are present and, and what habitats they're occurring in. Uh, this On the screen there, there's a, an image of one of the acoustic readouts and, and that shows a, an owl call, a Javan Scops owl. So excitingly, they've located the species by their calls at at least two sites now, and they'll be continuing to survey for the next six months. Next up, we have Milia Nabushi Tiko. Um, he's been researching the ecological and anthropogenic factors influencing the status and distribution of hooded vultures in southwest Ethiopia. Um, this work is actually also contributing to Milian's PhD at Jimna University in Ethiopia. Uh, hooded vultures are classed as critically endangered. Million has been looking at their distribution using uh, counts, uh, point counts, road counts, counts at abattoirs, dump sites, and counts at roost sites. Um, he's also been carrying out questionnaires among the local community to assess um, the level of threats to the species. And his team have already carried out surveys across three cities in southwest Ethiopia. Um, and he did the, the first round of surveys in the rainy season, and he's currently completing a, a resurvey of those sites during the dry season to look at the relative abundance. Then we've got David Vellamil from Colombia, who's been working on the cloud forest pygmy owl. Um, the species is so poorly known that it wasn't, it wasn't even recognized as a distinct species from other pygmy owls until it was described um, as a species in 1999. It's listed as vulnerable on the red list, and its distribution is really restricted to the cloud forests of Colombia and Ecuador. And as I hear from David, the high altitude habitats which it lives in and the apparently low density which it occurs at make it very difficult to study. Nevertheless, David has been undertaking forest transects. He's also been in installing acoustic recorders, and he plans to install nest boxes to find out more about their distribution, their basic breeding biology, and a diet. So far, he's located um, the owl in one forest area, but he is concerned about the rapid deforestation, which may affect the future of the species in that location. And then last but not least, um, this year we've been supporting the work of Marilyn De La Torre in the Philippines. Marilyn is a proud member of the indigenous community of the Dumaga, where she advocates biodiversity conservation and indigenous people's rights. 
She also works as a researcher for a local conservation NGO there. And her project is on the Philippines hawk eagle, which is critically endangered. Um, she aim, aims to understand more about its distribution and its abundance in the in an ancestral forest on Luzon Island um, to be able to inform its conservation. Marilyn has been training a local team uh, to undertake point surveys within the indigenous community cons conservation area. And she's been performing questionnaire surveys to determine the general local knowledge about the threats and the culture and the economic value of the Philippines hawk eagle. Her work has been tough. It's been hampered a little by typhoons, um, but they have recorded the eagle in their surveys. So, yeah, all of these projects, we've been really impressed by what uh, each of the researchers have achieved so far, and we are really looking forward to catching up with them again in about six months' time when they report back on their, their final findings. And uh, moving forward, this is a, a summary of the applications we received for the grants from this round. We had a really interesting spread of applications across the priority regions and on threatened and understudied species. You can see along those bottom uh, pies there that more than half of the Af uh, applications are actually from Africa. Um, half of them were on vultures. And the majority were on critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable species. So it was really tough to select the winners. Um, we took a two pronged approach in our evaluation. And first, the science staff at Hawkwatch evaluated the, pro the proposals based on scientific rigor, um, conservation impact, and the contribution that the projects would have to local capacity development. And following that, the finalists for each of the, the regions were evaluated by a board of regional experts. So I'm really grateful to the time and consideration for the proposals. So for the African um, proposals, Munir Varani took a look. Munir has got over 25 years of raptor experience spanning four continents. He's worked with raptors in neotropical region, South Asia, Mongolia, East Africa, I don't think I could possibly name all of the projects he's been involved in, but Mania is now the chief executive officer at um, the Mohammed bin Zayed Conservation uh, Raptor Conservation Fund. So he gave some va valuable input um, for Asia. We had Tulsi Sabedi review applications, and Tulsi has over a decade of experience in wildlife research and conservation. His PhD was on one of my personal favorites, the bearded vulture. And he's worked for Bird Conservation Nepal as a field as a as a vulture field biologist. And he's now the director of programs at the Himalayan Nature um, in Nepal. And then in Latin America, we had Juan Manuel Grande give his expert opinion. And, and Manuel brings over 20 years of raptor experience to our review panel. His work at the National Scientific and Technical um, Research Council focuses quite broadly on, on the ecology and the conservation of raptors in Argentina. And so, yeah, just a big thank you to the Hawkwatch team and to the regional experts for the time reviewing the grant applications. I personally think it was a tough year. Um, we had a really high quality of proposals, making the decision quite difficult. Um, but we're very excited about this year's win winners. And I'm actually going to hand over now to Nikki Waymont, our executive director, to introduce our, our first winner. Thanks, Meg. So in no particular order, our first grant is awarded to Abiola Shafri, who will be investigating the prevalence of hooded vultures in markets in Benin, West Africa. This project is really relevant to a growing conservation issue across Africa, where traditional healers are increasingly using the body parts of vultures for medicinal purposes. You can imagine that this has created a large illegal market for vulture parts uh, throughout the world. Uh, the worst poisoning event of vultures ever recorded um, in Guinea-Bissau in 2021 resulted in around 2,000 hooded vultures being poisoned. 
We know that in Benin, vulture parts are being sold in markets as one of Abiola's um, photos of a live hooded vulture at a market shows. But there's still little information on how many vultures are being used in markets, where they're coming from, the economic value, and how they're being used. So we feel like this information is very essential to being able to raise awareness um, and introduce appropriate protection measures for these vultures. Abiola will be using the grant to survey markets and undertake questionnaires with vendors to map the origin of vulture parts in order to get a better understanding of how they're being used, the value and the perceptions of the sellers toward the conservation status of hooded vultures. The information will then allow him to create educational outputs such as targeted posters and radio messages in hopes of raising awareness on the current vulture crisis in Africa and really around the globe. Um, our team thought this was really important work. Uh, it focuses on a critically endangered species in a country where support for raptor conservation is really needed. So we're very excited to offer this award to Abiola and excited to see the outcomes of his project. Great, thank you, Nikki. And um, I'm going to talk about our next awardee, Lungton, in who comes from Bhutan. And with his grant, we'll be supporting his work on the palace's fish eagle. So the palace's fish eagle is listed as endangered, and it has a population estimate of around 1,000 to 2,500 mature individuals. Um, it breeds in India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Bhutan, and its populations are likely declining across its whole range due to habitat loss, uh, felling of large trees near wetlands, changes in the ecology of fresh water systems due to anthropogenic activities, including draining of wetlands for agriculture, building of of hydroelectric dams and pollution with pesticides. So they've they've got a lot going against them, but Lungton will be surveying major rivers in Bhutan where palaces fish eagles are known to occur in order to assess the population status of the species and the prevalence of current threats. Based on the data he collects, um, he aims to undertake a species distribution modeling to be able to map the potential distribution of the e this eagle um, throughout Bhutan. So this is collecting some really important conservation information that we just just doesn't exist right now. So can, yeah, really considering the, the prevalence of the threats and the poor information currently available on population and the distribution of the species, we felt that Longton's um, proposed work could have quite a sig significant impact for the conservation of this species. So we're happy to award him with with a grant this year. All right. Okay. Well, our yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Our next award is for Arjun Kanan's project on pied harriers in India. Um, Despite having a very large distribution throughout much of Asia, Pied Harriers are significantly understudied. There are less than five scientific publications on this species, making it probably the most understudied harrier in the world. The aim of Arjun's project is to map and make counts at important roosting sites of the species in India. Harriers often roost communally in static locations, so long-term monitoring of roost sites can be really helpful in determining the population trends. Um, so although this species isn't currently known to breed in India, with the breeding range predominantly in China and Mongolia, there is at least one historic record from the 1980s of Pied Harriers successfully raising chicks for two consecutive years in the Asman state of India. So Arjun plans to resurvey these marshlands in the region to search for poten potential breeding sites. He's already done some data and collected, done some work and collected data on potential roost locations uh, from an individual harrier that was fitted with a satellite tracker last year. And he's using this data in combination with eBird sightings um, to plan his survey areas. Given how little we know about this species, we felt this project has great potential to collect baseline data 
and to fill some important knowledge gaps. And we're really excited to follow Arjun's progress on this species of least concerned in India. Great. And then in Latin America, we awarded Brian Gomez um, a grant for his study on rufous tailed hawks in Chile. So rufous tailed hawks are listed as vulnerable, um, but they have a very small global population of less than a thousand mature individuals, and they are found in the temperate forests of Chile and Argentina. They usually nest in emergent trees in the in these forests, but they've also been found more recently nesting in exotic plantations. Um, and their main threat in both of these habitats really is, is habitat loss and felling of their nest trees. So although it's known that rufous tailed hawks can breed in exotic forests, very little is actually known about their breeding productivity, how it compares to natural forests. And I actually really like the brand's background photo here showing the study area and the stark differences in these habitats. So understanding more about the relative productivity of the species in these contrasting habitats is going to be very important to enable conservation planning and management, um, such as the protection of suitable habitat or even in some cases specific trees from logging. So Brian will be using but will be undertaking nest surveys and monitoring the monitoring active nests to record the number of eggs which are laid and the number of chicks which successfully fledge in both native and exotic forests. Forests, And we felt that this project is important because understanding how species deal with forest activities is really critical to conservation, particularly given the expansion of exotic forestry in Southern Chile and its economic relevance today. Back to Nikki for our last one. So you may recognize the name of one of last year's awardees, David Villami, or Villamil, I always say that wrong. Um, so one of the things we were really hoping to do as this grant evolved over the years was to be able to add um, second year grants to projects we had been funding in the past. Um, and with the generous support of Caddis Enterprises, we're able to do that this year and to make an impact on individuals and the species where we can see that there's an ongoing value um, for those projects that we've been funding. So based on our project updates over the past year, we could see that that was really the case for David's work on the cloud forest pygmy owl. He hasn't had the easiest of conditions for working this year. from the photo why the cloud forest earns its name. Um, it is an incredibly difficult place to work. One of the acoustic recorders uh, that David installed failed, uh, which obviously limited the amount of data he was able to collect. And he didn't have enough nest boxes, uh, which he had been planning to install to be able to get the information on the breeding and the diet of the species. So we felt that David could use an additional grant to continue working on his important work and contributing to the conservation of this little known species of forest owl. So we're really excited to offer our first ever second year grant um, to David and his work on the cloud forest pygmy owl um, in Colombia with, again, the really generous support of Caddis Enterprises. Great. Well, to end, I think it's nice to just reflect on the, the map again and, and see uh, the distribution of the grants that we've awarded over the past three years um, since we've been running the program. And the locations of the projects are nicely distributed in the high priority areas that we looked at in the beginning. So um, we hope that we are contributing to forwarding conservation and filling some of the knowledge gaps in these countries while contributing to equity and conservation. And most of all, we we're looking forward to hearing more from this grant this year's grant winners as their projects uh, start to progress. 
And with that, I'm going to wrap up this presentation by again thanking Caddis Enterprise for their sponsorship, which has made this year's grants possible, and by congratulating all of our awardees, as well as thanking them for their hard work and commitment to raptor conservation. If you do have any questions about the grant or um, Hawkwatch's international program, please feel free to contact us on the email address there. We will be providing updates on the progress of these projects over the coming months and years, so look out for that in our um, blogs and, or sign up for our newsletter. And thank you very much for attending this presentation and best of luck to our award recipients. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Kirsten. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mag, and thanks to uh, everyone who reviewed the grants this year, once again, to Caddis Enterprises for their support, and for all of you who are joining us either live or for the replay, if you do have any questions, like Mag said, just direct them to that email address or to hwi at hawkwatch.org, and we'd be happy to connect you with some information about our wonderful grantees. Thanks, y'all. Looking forward to updating you. Have a good one.